helping us to understand the counselling process and why it can be effective. Um, it doesn't so much change counselling. Oh, can I just ask someone to put their yeah. mics on? Put, your, put yourself on mute, please. Oh, we've got a baby crying there somewhere in the background. Oh, yep, yeah, that seems to have gone. <laughs> um, so yeah, it doesn't so much uh, change counselling, the, the, the counselling that's been happening for decades now, but it does inform us, it tells us a little bit about what some of those magical qualities of, uh, of counselling, why they're actually uh, effective th through, through our greater understanding of what happens in the brain and our, in our nervous system, and particularly helps explain, explain the magic of the, the therapeutic relationship between the counsellor and the client which is the all important feature. So first of all, just to, to think a little bit about what counselling is and what brings a person to counselling. Well, there's a variety of reasons that a person will seek out a counsellor or a, a psychotherapist, including things like depression, anxiety, trauma, grief, relationship issues, internal conflict, uh, lack of motivation to change, addictions, existential crisis, uh, sometimes a combination of all of those things. But above all, uh, no matter what the presenting issue, clients generally uh, come because they feel really confused and uncertain uh, about which direction to take, about, uh, about how they want to live their lives. And the role of a counsellor is essentially to listen, to help the client clarify their thoughts, feelings and behaviours, and to assist the client to figure out what it is that they do want to change and to offer guidance when, it's, when it is appropriate, when it's asked for, uh, without, but without directing the client how to live their life. And uh, based on insights from contemporary neuroscience, the ultimate challenge is to rewire the brain. And that's what we're gonna, gonna focus on uh, over the next, the next um, the next hour, <clears throat> just under an hour. So what do we mean by neuroscience? So neuroscience describes the function of the brain and the nervous system. And neuroplasticity refers to the brain's ability to reshape itself through new experience. And while you don't need to understand all of the ins and outs of how the brain functions, it can be really helpful uh, to, to understand some of the, the basic concepts and, and uh, particularly around this idea of neuroplasticity. Uh, people used to think that, that our, our brains were, our, our, um, our patterns of thinking and our behaviours, our behaviour traits and our, our neural networks were, were relatively fixed and couldn't be changed. Uh, but of course, over the, over the last, particularly the last couple of decades, uh, going back even longer than that, but over the past two decades, uh, neuroscience has really uh, explored the brain in, in ways that we haven't been able to do before. But uh, there's this idea that, that our, our neural networks are, are very uh, adaptable. They can, they can be changed, although it's sometimes it, it, you know, it takes, takes a lot of hard work. When, 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 when you think about any change that you've wanted to make for yourself, any habit that you've wanted to get rid of or, or to create a new habit of, of exercise or something like that, for instance, you'll know that it's not easy to, uh, to get rid of old habits and, and begin new ones. Well, this is all related to, to our neural networks and brain plasticity. So it's not easy, but it is possible to change the way that we see the world. So the three points that, that I've kind of discovered in my research into what neuroscience is all about are these three points. And it's three, these three points that in the unit, in the, in the, uh, uh, across the 12 weeks that this unit covers are the three points that I pick up again and again and show in what, in what ways the various different counseling models um, address these issues. Um, not necessarily explicitly, but, but that they're, they're interwoven within the models. The first one is the regulation of the nervous system. 
And the second is identifying neural networks, or another way of thinking about that is the different parts of the self. Um, and th the third one is a thing called memory reconsolidation, which is a natural process in the brain which eliminates old neural networks and replaces them with updated networks. So I'm going to go through these three things and explain these a little bit further, because at the moment that might mean very little to you. So first of all, the, the, the regulation of the nervous system. So this is a really easy model to think about how our nervous system works. This is from a psychologist by the name of Daniel Siegel. And he, he came up with this model called the window of tolerance that many other psychologists and counselors and psychotherapists uh, now use. So the window of tolerance, this is when we're feeling calm. So our autonomic nervous system isn't in a fight, flight or a freeze response. We're, it means that we're really calm, we're able to think and feel at the same time. We're, we're very much aware of what's going on around us and what's happening inside of us internally. We're aware of our feelings and our thoughts. And we're able to react to, to situations around us in this very calm, composed uh, manner. Doesn't mean to say that we might not feel stress, but we don't become overwhelmed by stress. Um, so, however, when we move outside of our window of tolerance, we can go up into what, what, what is called hyper arousal, which is where we're hyper aware or vigilant. We're overly, uh, uh, overly quick or we have overly quick or intense reactions to things that happen around us. Uh, feel like we have, the, have a feeling, a lack of emotional safety, and we feel overwhelmed by our emotions. Uh, another term for being in hyper, hyper, hyper arousal is the fight flight response. So when, we're, when we feel under threat, we go into this fight flight response, which means we can feel very fearful uh, or, or very angry as a, as a defense against feeling threatened, and we go into a fight response. Another way of describing this is anxiety. Anxiety is when we're in a state of hyper arousal. Now the other end of the scale is we might drop down into what is called hypo arousal, which is this very shut down, flat or numb sensation where it's hard to think, we feel very disconnected, it feel, uh, feels a sense of shame, can't say no, and this is like a, a freeze response. It's when we're so afraid that we just shut down in fear altogether. And so what, what we've discovered is that in counseling, a part of the, part of the, um, the beauty of being with a counselor who is able to stay in their window of tolerance, who are able to remain calm, um, will actually um, influence the client's nervous system. So in, in other words, our nervous systems tend to talk to each other. So we co-regulate with each other. So if you're with a counselor who's very calm and kind and compassionate and has empathy and, and is non-judgmental, then it's likely going to bring the client into their own window of tolerance where they're able to think and feel and, and get a sense of their own uh, and come up with their own solutions and their own, their own uh, ideas about how, how they might change their situation. So, so, the, so the relate this, and this is where the counseling relationship is, is really important because we, if, we can, if we can help our clients to remain calm, then they're, they're more highly, they're more able to, to function in the world <clears throat> and to learn how to regulate their own nervous system over time. <clears throat> Excuse me, just take a sip of water. So neural networks. So neural networks basically represent our patterns of thinking, feeling and behaving. And these have evolved through exp the experiences that we've had. Uh, associations are made that become linked together. Uh, and you'll, you might have heard of the term neurons that fire together, wire together. <clears throat> so once you make associations, um, they, they, be, they, they become, kind of become stored as, as memories 
that help us to remember things, help us to remember how to get up in the morning and make a cup of coffee, how to tie our shoelaces, how to do the most basic, uh, the ba basic activities that, that we need to do in our daily lives. If we didn't have these neural networks, <clears throat> we'd be forever having to figure out how to do things because we would forget all the time. Um, so an example of that might be, let's say every morning, an example of how these associations can build and create these networks might be that every morning at 11 o'clock <clears throat> you, you have a cup of coffee and uh, you those of you who are coffee drinkers will know that you get, can get very very irritable if at 11 o'clock there is no coffee to be had this is because your network is is up and alert because it knows it's 11 o'clock it knows it's time to have a cup of coffee so let's try a little bit of an experiment here. <clears throat> I just want you to cl close your eyes or you can keep them open if you're more comfortable doing that, but close your eyes if, if you like, if you feel comfortable. And I want you to think of the word dog. And I want you to sort of meditate on, on that word dog and notice, notice what comes to your mind. You might think of a particular dog that you have owned or own now or just a more generalized picture of a dog. But sit with that feeling, and I really want you to just take a couple of minutes to go into this image that you have of a dog and notice what you feel in your body. What sensations do you notice in your body? What feelings, what emotions come up for you as you think about a dog? And what are the thoughts that you're having? I'm just gonna give you a couple of minutes to just do that. Okay, so if you, if you did that properly, if you really got into that little exercise, some of you will have experienced warm feelings and positive emotions. Uh, others may have had a negative experience and, and others may have had a relatively neutral response. And the reason why you will have different responses because it would depend on your history with dogs and the associations you've made due to your experience. Uh, I was bitten by a dog when I was around about nine or ten. So for many years, I was quite fearful of dogs uh, and would try to avoid them. And it wasn't until uh, I was older and had friends who had dogs that I be my, my brain began to realize, oh, not all dogs bite. So I had a very different response to dogs. I'd, I'd still say that I, I retain a little bit of wariness to new dogs that I, I haven't met before. Uh, but in general, my, I don't have a fear of dogs. So my network changed, my initial network, my initial neural network to, to the sight of a dog would be to go into a, a fear response. Um, so your, your physiological and psychological response, for instance, to the image of the running dog to the left is dependent on what your brain predicts is going to happen next. Because this is the thing about the brain. This is a, a it's a, an organ that, that predicts each moment to moment, uh, um, whatever is happening in the moment is trying to predict what is going to happen next. That's the way that our brains evolved. So if you were someone who was bitten by a dog, <clears throat> seeing a running dog, might, your brain might go, oh, better get out of the way better run don't want to don't want to get bitten by this dog whereas if you had good experiences with a, with a dog you might think oh this dog's running up to to greet me and to say hello to me and uh, i'm going to get ready to play with this dog so uh, i hope that what you've what you understand here is that what you've experienced through this exercise is a network uh, a, a neural network comes with it a felt sense in the body it, it usually has an emotion and thoughts and, and behaviors. So whether you run or run away from this dog or whether you move towards this dog, your neural network is all designed to, to keep you safe or, or, to, um, or to motivate you to approach a situation. 
and depend and, and again as i said depending on your experience and how your your brain predicts what's going to happen will determine how you how you respond uh, and, and it's a mixture of that and also just your perception, your, your, your senses. You, you, we can sense danger. We, for instance, we can't hear that dog here, but if this dog was, was barking and growling, we'd, we'd, we'd be alerted that, oh, maybe this is not such a friendly dog, whereas if it's wagging its tail and it's, you know, there's a certain kind of demeanor about the dog that tells you it's friendly. So uh, it's a mixture on what we see what our what our senses tell us about what's happening, and and a and a sense of our own experience. So thinking about, uh, and our brain will do this automatically. It will find, uh, it will try to find uh, information, uh, stored information that can that can help us predict what is going to happen. So I hope that makes sense. So here's another experiment to try that's that's also related to this idea of our neural networks. I want you to bring to mind someone that you love, but also someone who can really irritate you, that they maybe they have some behavior that, that you find particularly irritating. And what I want you to do is uh, conjure up this person in your mind and focus on the thing that really irritates you about this person. What is it that really bothers you? And I'm gonna give you a, a minute or two to, to think about that. So again, you should have, if you're doing this, you know, really focusing on this properly, you should have a felt experience as you think about what it is that irritates you about this person, an emotion towards this person as you think these thoughts, and, and some very strong thoughts might be coming up about, you know, what a selfish person this, 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 this person is. So now I want you to, so that's one network. This is, and this is what I'm talking about, the different parts. When I mentioned earlier that we can think of networks as being different parts. So this is the part of you that's quite angry towards this person, let's say, if that's the emotion that comes up. Now I want you to imagine this person again, but to focus on the things that you love about them. And again, <clears throat> as you think about this person from that perspective, notice now what what shifts happen what what happens in your body what where do where do you go in, in terms of your thoughts what emotions do you feel so i'll give you a couple of minutes to do that Okay, and what you should have noticed here is a, is a shift in your, in your state, a shift in your nervous system. Whereas in the, in the first instance, you might have felt your nervous system get a little bit irritable, maybe a little bit kind of worked up. Uh, hopefully when you, when you thought about this same person and all the things that you love about them, your nervous system calmed down and went into your window of tolerance. Now, of course, we only had a couple of minutes to do that. And obviously the longer you do that, you could, you could really, um, feel the, the 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 shift, but this is the power of the mind. This is the power of, the, of of our minds to be able to shift states and to move from one neural network into another. Okay, so now to talk a little bit more about memory and and again some of the some of the um, things I'm going to talk about here. We're, we're we're thinking about memory from a very sort of metaphorical uh, point of view. It is, oh, can someone, someone's got their mic on? Can I just get someone to? Uh, um, I don't know if you can hear me, but someone's got their microphone on. Yeah, thanks. 
So, so yeah, so the, the, we'll be talking about memory banks and, and these are metaphors. It's, it's, it, there's no one file that, that is in our brain where we keep our memories. And uh, it's a compli complicated procedure that involves different parts of the brain and the neural networks and all the rest of it. So, so just bearing in mind that these are metaphors, but they're, they're quite helpful in helping us understand how memory works. Now, there are two types of memories. There's what, what is known as explicit memories, which are deliberate cognitive process, which is a deliberate cognitive process as you try to remember information that was once learned through the same deliberate, deliberate and cognitive process of, say, studying for an exam. So when th this involves you sitting down, reading books, coming to lectures, taking notes, being very deliberate in what it is you're trying to remember and learn. And this gets stored into our long-term memory banks. And then there are implicit memories, which are things that are unconsciously learnt. Uh, and uh, an example of this might be singing, for instance that you know, most of us learn at some point how to sing, whether we're in tune or not is another matter, but everyone knows how to sing along to a pop song, for instance. And this doesn't require cognitive processing or recall. It's just something that we do and that just kind of happens. And the thing about these implicit memories is that the, the, these are the ones that, that can be more problematic in terms of uh, because we can be triggered by our, our implicit memories. Uh, so th these are the types of memories that are, um, can be activated out of the blue. So for instance, um, I have, a, 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 whenever I smell cut grass, I'm always instantly taken back to childhoods growing up in a village that I grew up in in Scotland. And I have really happy memories of long summers in Scotland. Not that they were particularly warm, but they were, they were what we had to, that's all we had to go by. So <laughs> I'm not sure I would appreciate it now that I've lived in Australia all these years. But anyway, that smell just out of the blue will take me back to that place. Uh, at, be, because the smell of grass reminds me of my father who'd be out cutting the grass. Uh, but the same kinds of Triggers can also lead us back to a, a traumatic memory, which can cause all kinds of problems. So these, and these implicit memories are often at the root of many unwanted behaviors, thoughts, and feelings. We don't know where they came from. Sometimes we just don't, we don't know what, what came over us. You know, suddenly we were feeling anxious and we don't know why. It's often because of these implicit memories. And they're the hardest to reach because they were learned at a pre-conscious level of awareness. So in other words, we didn't sit down and deliberately try to try to remember this event. It just uh, it just got remembered because it was such a strong um, event. So storing implicit mem memories, so trivial experiences are generally only stored for a short period of time and they never make it to our long-term memory banks because we don't have any need for it. If we were to remember every single thing that we did, I mean, well, it would be quite impossible, really, wouldn't it? Uh, experiences that are emotionally charged, on the other hand, or, or are, are important to remember for survival purposes, get filed into long-term memory to help the brain make predictions. So in my case, uh, being bitten by a dog when I was nine years old, uh, I didn't particularly want to remember that, but, but my brain decided, hey, we need, to, we need to store this information away so that we know what to do when we see a dog running at us next time. And that helps us predict the future, what, what's going to happen next. Um, Unfortunately, though, uh, as, I, as I pointed out, not all dogs do bite. So this information, while it, it might have been handy at some point, is not generally, as a rule, is not a, a very, very useful information because it means I'm afraid of quite friendly dogs or I was quite afraid of friendly dogs for a long time. Uh, so our brain doesn't always get it right, in other words. 
so, okay, so here's the idea now, now of memory consolidation. So this is the storing of experiences into long-term memory and is known as memory consolidation. And in this way, a pattern of networks are stabilized. And in this process, important information is now ready, uh, readily available when needed for a variety of tasks as well as predictions. So again, the more so let's let's assume so i was only bitten once by a dog so my fear of dogs was never terribly problematic you know i was a little bit wary of them but i wasn't terrified of dogs but let's just say i i got bitten by a dog again then then this um is just going to consolidate this network even more it's going to it's going to strengthen this this idea that I have in my head now, this concept that all dogs are dangerous and must be avoided. Did I mute myself there? <clears throat> sorry about that. Not sure quite what happened there. Um, so, so sorry, just to go to go over that again. Then, if I were to to go home, if I if after having been bitten by a dog, I go home and I think about that and repeat that memory over and over in my mind, and fret over the dog bite, then I'm much more. That network is going to get stronger and stronger, and my fear will be will become stronger. Uh, whereas if I just went home and just brushed it off as something that happened, then I might, I might, I might not really have been so strongly affected by by being bitten by a dog on that occasion. So in other words, the more that you dwell on something, the more that you 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 think things through and and wallow in this story, the stronger that network will become. Okay, so. Up, so this is the and this is the good news. This is what neuroscience tells us is that we, we've learned that the brain has the capacity to update those files. So once it realizes, once I realized, for instance, in my example, that all once I had enough experiences of dogs over the years, then my brain updated the information. It updated this file that says all dogs are dangerous and will bite you. And it changed it to this more helpful and more realistic uh, uh, model, which is, oh, you know, most dogs actually are quite safe to be around. They're quite playful and they, they won't bite you. So my brain, my, these neural networks were adjusted. Um, and this is the, 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 the term for this is, is memory reconsolidation. And this is what, what we've realized is really useful to know and understand as a counselor. So let's take the, the metaphor of the filing your memories away. And remember, it is just a metaphor. We don't actually have a file in our brain where we store things. But think about um, a zip file. So implicit memories that have been stored unconsciously are the most difficult to reach. And the metaphor of this filing system is helpful here. So, so, so once, once a file is zipped, it's a little bit harder to get to, you know, if you, you know, you get something sent to you, you've got to go and unzip the thing. It doesn't open up naturally. And this is the same way with memories. Memories are kind of stored pretty tightly and we need to be able to, in order to update the file, we need to unzip it first. So if we're going to change our memory, if we're going to cha change the, the, um, the, the neural network, we need to open it up first. And how do we do that? Okay, well, this is, this is where we go into memory reconsolidation. 
So when we learn new information, we develop these schemas and schemas are ideas, they're beliefs. So my schema was, you know, all dogs are dangerous and are likely to bite you. That's a schema. So schemas in psychological terms describe patterns of thought or behavior that categorizes new information in order to make sense of the world. So we do this in order to group things together so that, so that there's a, a sense of order in our lives. Uh, and unlocking the zip file occurs whenever something triggers the activation of an implicit memory. And, and let's say, as I said earlier, the smell of a cut grass. Uh, it reminds me of my childhood. Um, but also seeing a dog running towards me might unlock the, the zip file of this, this schema that says all dogs are dangerous. So once the file is open, a process of reconsolidation occurs before it's again locked up into the zip file and the, and the neural network is now strengthened. So this refers back to what I said earlier. If, if, um, if say the dog comes, a dog comes running towards me and the, my neural network is reopened and I get fearful of the dog. Now, now those of you who understand uh, dogs and have pets will know that uh, if a dog feels afraid of you and if my reaction to the dog scares the dog, the dog might well bite me. So then, then that memory has been reconsolidated. It's just strengthened my belief that all dogs are dangerous and will bite me. So that's reconsolidation. When we open up the network and we have a similar experience, it just gets stronger. And, and also likewise, if we open up the network and we start to worry about dogs being dangerous, then that is going to strengthen the network. I'm hoping that this is all making sense. So the thing is, how do we interrupt this reconsolidation? And this is what we can do as counsellors and, and in fact do do as counsellors, although we didn't properly understand the, the science behind it. So what if it were possible to disrupt this process, to disrupt this process of reconsolidation in order to change the schema? In this way, such things such as fear conditioning could be erased. Um, Conscious recall continues, but unconscious beliefs about the state of the world has changed. Now, what that means is that you don't forget. I, I, I won't ever forget I was bitten by the dog. That's in my memory now forever. Uh, but I won't have the reaction to that memory that I used to have. It doesn't make me fearful, in other words, to remember being bitten by that dog. So the emotional impact, the, the uh, is no longer there because the schema has been disrupted because I know now not all dogs bite. Most dogs don't bite. So the MR protocol, so in, in counselling, what we need to do is we need to bring the network in, into an open state by activating the memory. We need to open the zip file and then we need to introduce information that disproves Th th this schema or narrative that the person has been uh, living with. So let me give you an example of that. Okay, so this two-step process works because the brain is naturally inclined to getting rid of old information that doesn't match with current reality. And this is the great thing, this is the great discovery from neuroscience, that the brain actually will do this of its own accord Remember, the brain is geared towards making accurate predictions and it learns from experience what to keep and what to discard if the conditions are right for it to do so. In other words, new information that more accurately maps the reality of the present moment is chosen over old schemas that are discovered to be out of date. So again, to go back to my experience, uh, the, the um, once I had had the uh, good experiences with dogs, my brain was ready to dump the old schema because it was no, it was not really helpful. It wasn't really serving any purpose, and it adopted this new schema, this new idea that you know dogs can be actually quite fun to be around. 
So here's an example. So let's imagine a client who comes to counseling because they have trouble forming lasting intimate relationships. So over time, the client re reveals a firm belief that it's not safe to share feelings. Through investigation, it is further discovered that growing up in a household where expressing feelings was met with cold hearted rejection, then we can see where the schema, it's not safe to share my feelings, comes from. The counselor encourages the client to notice this schema and to compare what happens when sharing their feelings in the session or with other people in their life who are supportive. So in other words, what we're doing is, we're, first of all, we have to help the client to be able to recognize the stories that they tell themselves that are unhelpful, the schema, this, this, this belief system that has um, evolved from experience that it's not safe to share my feelings. And we need to help the person. And once they recognize this, and once they're able to get in touch with this, this story that they tell themselves and feel the pain of it, really, feel the pain of you know, how, how it feels not to feel safe. Uh, and then we encourage this, this new story, this new, we look for examples when that's not the case. And for some clients, um, the, the first experience of feeling safe to, to express their feelings is with their counsellor. Uh, which again, you know, goes back to what, what I was saying earlier about the nervous system and how, and how if we are calm as counsellors, if we're calm and we're non-judgmental and we're compassionate and kind and all of those lovely things, then this soothes the client's nervous system so that they feel calm and safe. And then they're able to talk about their feelings, maybe for the first time. And this allows this change in the, in the brain, this change in the neural networks from one to feeling it's not safe to approach others to feeling, oh, well, maybe some people are quite safe. Maybe, maybe it is okay to talk about my feelings. Uh, and then uh, this, this really, does change change the brain um, hopefully for good if if the client can then also go out into the real world and start to experiment and and uh, feel feel brave enough to connect with other people in their lives so brain intelligence so when the brain is faced with two realities at the same time so the old schema and the new information that disconfirms the old learning, it receives an error, an error message. The predictive brain realizes something's not working properly and decides it's time to update the file. So again, my experience with the dog, the two realities at the same time, you know, the part of my brain that, that tells me, be on alert, there's a dog, and then the dog comes up and it's wagging its tail and really just wants a pet and a cuddle. And if I can uh, uh, let that experience in, if I can actually notice this, then my brain will update the file and will, will tell me that, you know, dogs are, dogs are safe. Most dogs are safe. So the conditions in order for this memory reconsolidation to be successful, the original memory needs to be felt in the moment. It needs to be an embodied experience and not only a cognitive exercise, which is why it, you know, a lot of the, um, a lot of so, some of the counseling styles, for instance, cognitive behavior therapy, it only really can work if it's also a, a felt and, and embodied experience. We can't just think our way out of something. We can't just tell ourselves, don't be silly. Dogs, of course, of course dogs don't bite. We need to experience that at a level that is an embodied feeling. We need to be in the, in the presence of a dog that is not going to attack us. And in that way, we have this embodied experience where, where our, our nervous system can react in a new way. Uh, and then, and then the, the rewiring of the brain can, can occur. So this is why um, sometimes when people say to you, just 
just think positively. Uh, it, it, it doesn't always work. It, it also needs that, that experience, that experiential level needs to, to occur as well for the, for the nervous system to really get it, for our brain to really get it. So the models of counselling. So the steps of memory reconsolidation are possible across a wide range of counselling models, particularly where the counsellor encourages those experiential moment to moment process, moments of processing. Um, and therapeutic breakthroughs most likely occur through the process of memory reconsolidation, even if the counsellor did not intend this or has no knowledge of the process. Because remember, MR is a naturally occurring phenomena that the brain is primed to utilize whenever new information is available. So, um, and you know, if I had more time, I would really love to sort of go into some of the various models that do this. Um, but essentially, any, any counseling model where a client feels safe because they trust you as a counselor uh, and, uh, and you are in your window of tolerance at all time, if you are able to remain calm, um, this will help the client regulate their own nervous system so that they will then become calm. And in that process, they're able to now explore their feelings, their thoughts, their behaviors, make connections with past experiences that may have um, uh, may have been part of uh, 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 int introduced these narratives that are unhelpful, uh, formulated these unhelpful networks whereby everything is, um, everything is fearful, everything is to be feared. If we can start, start to create some opportunities where they can have a new experience that, that uh, an example of this as well too might be something like phobias. If someone, for instance, has, a, has panic attacks when they go to the supermarket and the fear around going into the supermarket is, is all linked to what we've been talking about here, um, the, the, because the, the predictive brain it, it tells you, oh, supermarkets are not safe. You know, you had a panic attack when you went into the supermarket. So every time you even think about going to the supermarket, you might even have a panic attack. So, so exposure therapy, as an example, would gradually work up towards the client being able to go into a supermarket and, and not die, basically, not have a panic attack where in the, where, while they're in the supermarket. So at a very experiential level, the body learns, hey, supermarkets are safe. There's nothing to, there's nothing to be afraid of going, to it, going into a supermarket. So <clears throat> there are... Yeah, there are dozens of different counselling models and you will, you know, if you decide to come and, and do counselling, you, you kind of learn about these various different models and, and, and would quickly re uh, recognise some of these themes that we're talking about here. So conclusion that the safety of the therapeutic relationship creates the necessary conditions that can literally change the brain, change the, the neural networks in the brain. Searching for and addressing original belief systems, these schemas that are unhelpful and no longer serving a purpose is critical. And the process needs to be experiential. It needs to be at a, um, a, a felt experience, not just a cognitive experience. <clears throat> And all counselling models have been shown to benefit from this naturally, naturally occurring trick of the brain. And uh, yeah, I hope that that has, has given you some indication of the, the, the exciting um, uh, topic of neuroscience and, and how it can be used in counselling. So a lot of this was taken from uh, a book called The Neuroscience of Psychotherapy, which is the textbook that, that is used in this particular unit. And, there, and also from this reading, Unlocking the Emotional Brain, which is uh, all about memory reconsolidation. And I'm gonna stop sharing now and we can, we can stop for, for any questions. <clears throat> Anybody got any questions?
Okay. Um, somebody's asking, how do I define the felt sense? Well, it's just, it's just the, the felt that what's happening in your body, you know, what's going on in your body. Do you feel tension anywhere? Do you feel, uh, and, and once we start to get a felt sense of our body, it usually leads to an emotion. Yeah. Um, do I recommend any neuroscience journals or papers we can read? Oh gosh, there are just so many that come out, but books in terms of books, I recommend reading Dan, Dan Siegel, Daniel Siegel, um, Bessel van der Kolk, um, that, that, that book that I mentioned, the Cosolino book is, is terrific. Uh, yeah, I can put the, uh, let me, t let me type, uh, oh gosh, I'm getting so many questions now, I can't keep up with you all. It, this has been recorded, I believe. Um, Cognitive dissonance, someone's mentioned. Yes, it's very, that's, that's absolutely right. Cognitive dis dissonance. That's also very left brain, right brain uh, stuff. Oh, I could go into all of that as well, but I'm not going to have time for that. Uh, uh, trauma, um, talking about the female, what, what if this memory is traumatic and the client is re-traumatized? What are the best ways to help here? Oh gosh, that's that's a huge topic to answer. But yes, this, the, the, these techniques can be used uh, with uh, trauma victims, PTSD. But obviously, that needs to be done very, very carefully and with lots of safety procedures put in place so that the person is not re-traumatized. Um, what if the dog bites us again when we decided to try? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good question. Yeah, you'd have to go through it all over again, wouldn't you? Uh, titration is one met method. Yes, there's lots of lots of good points coming up here. Um, someone's mentioned Bruce Perry. Yeah, Bruce Perry's terrific too. He works a lot with kids and tra uh, trauma and and uh, PTSD with kids and various things. Uh, and no, neuroscience and counseling is not a degree. It's 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 a unit in the bachelor's, and and but it's not not a degree in itself. It's just one unit in a, in the in the course. Um, I'm probably not going to be able to get to all. I'm just sort of looking for. There's a lot of comments, and I'm trying to dig out the questions. Uh, what are your thoughts on the correlation between emotional dis-ease and the manifestation of physical disease? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely there is a connection. When we're stressed, uh, when our body's under a lot of stress, then it has huge impacts on things like our immune system and our digestion and all kinds of inflammatory conditions. Yes. Um, yeah, good. I'm um, just looking for other questions. Sorry that I muted it. I accidentally must have touched something. I hope it wasn't off for too long. <laughs> um, any other questions anyone wants to ask? And uh, does it mean that a person must be removed from the traumatic experience to fully heal the brain? What if the person can't get out of the situation that gives the same experience? Yeah, no, absolutely. They, they do need to get out of the, the traumatic situation. Yeah, you can't, it can't, it can't change if the brain keeps getting the same information that something is, un if you're thinking about family violence, for instance, uh, the brain will still keep, um, yeah, that's, the answer is that. Um, the, the, let me just bring up, a few people have asked for the, the reference. I'll just bring that up again so that you can see it. Yeah. So the book, the top one here is the textbook in the, in the unit that I'm talking about here. 
and and this is a, a reading that I'm sure you could um, you could source from the library for those of you I know some of you are, are I notice some of you are studying here already um, okay I can't uh, I can't look at my questions and share that at the same time. So <laughs> if anyone's got a question, you might need to put your microphone on. And Maybe I'll take that down now. Um, I've just got one about trauma. Uh, that's right. Yes, you. Yeah, so someone's asking about trauma. You, you'd certainly be going at the pace that the client the client wants to share. Yeah, you never force people to share their stories of trauma. In fact, it's it's believed now that people don't even need to talk about their traumatic experience. There are ways of working with it without actually having to 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 go into it in any great detail. Um, Somebody's asking if it's a if this particular unit can be done as a separate unit of study with a certificate of attainment. Um, not that I'm aware of. I don't think so. I don't know. Um, yes, I think. Yeah, I think I've kind of can't find any other questions that What is the pathway to become a neuroscience counselor? Um well I'm not sure that there 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 is a specific course on being a neuroscience counselor. I think there are probably um there's certainly not a degree in that that I'm aware of. You can there are workshops around, but you know you just just get your your degree, uh, and then and then build build upon it. Um, but I think ACAPS is as good as anywhere that that is introducing neuroscience. I think quite early. Um, so, and and it, and it is being introduced into the post grad as of next year and into the masters as well so we are really trying to build on this because it, it is exciting new new areas good um yeah okay that seems to be sort of about it Um, thank you for for coming, and I hope that that has piqued your your interest in uh, in coming to study at ACAP. I'd certainly very be very glad of the opportunity to to teach you all. Well, maybe not all at once. <laughs> uh, do I recommend any workshops on neuroscience? Look, uh, not specifically. Um, you know, there are lots of people coming out um there's uh you know people like pat ogden peter levine who've who've come over just last year um to talk about this but well there's lots of online stuff as well workshops yeah okay Uh, hi, Kaz. Um, so this hi is there. Joseph. I'm from the uh, student engagement team. Um, I was frantically trying to type before the uh, chat ended. I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, you'll be receiving the recording of this and the slides early next week. Uh, there are a number of questions in there about units. Um, in that, I will also attach links to the units done in uh, the various counselling courses. A single unit uh, cannot be done on its own. A course or a unit needs to be attributed to an award or a qualification. 
Um, and in regards to uh, particular career pathways, we have a um, team that is there to talk to you about exactly where you want to go and what quali qualifications are most appropriate. And so I'll attach a link into that email as well. So you're going to get a, a lot thrown at you. Um, should you want to have a further in-depth conversation about particular career pathways and stuff as well. So um, that will all come out to the email addresses you registered for this session with. Um, that's a lot from me. Thanks, guys. Great. And thank you. And sorry if I didn't get to all of your questions. Uh, there's, there's, uh, I tried to get through as many as, as possible. And uh, well, good luck with whatever you choose to do.